Janine McDonald. I am director of Theos, the religion and society think tank. What does anti-racism in practice mean to me? Well, it means three things. It means looking, listening and learning. So firstly, looking. It's about being aware, being hyper alert to the behaviours and words and structures that oppress people of certain races. It's about listening. It's about not imposing our own thoughts and will on others, but asking questions rather than making assumptions. Assumptions are the enemy of diversity and inclusion. It's also about learning, about recognising that we are not the heroes, nor are we the finished product, that anti-racism is a journey and it's a long game. Now, having looked, listened and learned, it's then time to act. Anti-racism in practice is about not being passive, but being courageous, taking steps outside our comfort zone. Anti-racism in practice looks like discomfort most of the time. We need to get comfortable with that discomfort. Welcome. Oh, what an absolutely brilliant opening address you had there from Ginny. I think that's probably um, the one that, that you've all for me. Welcome to episode five, Anti-Racism in Action, Voluntary Community and Social Enterprise Sector, and how we're going to be taking action um, against anti-racism. I want to base this episode actually around a lot of what Ginny covered there, because I think it was absolutely brilliant. The, the, the three L's around looking, listening and learning. Um, communication is obviously key. Asking the questions and not assuming. Um, because I just love that line that assumption is the enemy to diversity and inclusion. I mean, honestly, it's probably the best opening address. I feel really stirred up. And then how do we take action? And I think at the end, what I think we're going to have to cover as well is getting comfortable with the discomfort. Um, this is a total collaboration between Black FE Leadership Group and FE News. My co-host today is Stella. Stella, I wonder if you could join us in the studio today. Hey, Stella, how are you? Great, Gavin. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, really, really good. I, I think um, today is a really, really, really interesting episode. And I think in a minute, I want to set the scene as we always do. Um, but I think it's it's interesting for a number of reasons, because there's a lot of things which here um, we'll see that in the sort of um, looking at the background is, is going to be um, similar sort of narrative to what we've seen in, in, in education, in, in schools like last week, in HG, in, in FE. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, and I think um, also I want to really base today on sort of uh, Chini's three points around how we can look, listen and learn. And I just think is that's what the whole basis of this season has been around, hasn't it, really, is around everyone hasn't got all of the answers, but how we can come together as a, as a collective, really. Um, should I, should I, I know we've um, you've given some really interesting stats. So I don't know if you want me to sort of run through those um, sort of quickly, um, just to set the scene for because I didn't realise like ninety percent of this actually, um, and it's it's very very interesting. There's around one hundred and sixty nine thousand charities in the UK, and over eighty percent that's one hundred and thirty six thousand um, are small with less with an income less than a million pounds. Um, and many of these charities struggle with attracting trustees. In fact, it's been reported there's 100,000 trustee vacancies in the UK. Um, Akivo, which is um, the, the body which looks after the, the charity leaders and, and for the voluntary sector as well, and the Institute of Fundraising uh, released a publication called Racial Diversity in the Charity Sector, which had principles and recruitment practices back in 2018. You know, it's heady days when you could like, meet people and not wear masks and all this sort of stuff. Um, they highlighted um, the charity sector as a whole is failing to reflect the racial diversity of individuals, communities, and the geography it serves. When you bear in mind that a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to be around community, that's really interesting. Fewer than one in 10 voluntary sector employees, 9% are from black, Asian, or minority ethnic groups. And that's a lower proportion than we have in the public and private sectors, which are both 11%, and a lower proportion than in the UK as a whole, which is 14%. Stella, we've seen this so many times in, in yeah. education mm -hmm. as well. Um, there's even less racial diversity at executive and not executive leading levels in charities. Again, Stella, so we've seen in, in, in education. Again, it's just alarming that this is just being repeat, repeat, repeat. Of the largest 500 charities by income, this is a, a, an alarming stat. Only 5.3% uh, of people in senior leadership teams were from an ethnic minority background. Um, even more alarming 
is from Chinese and other Asian ethno cultured backgrounds are virtually non existent, making up just 0.3, that's 0.3% of charity leaders in the largest 100 charities by income. Akivo's Pay and Equalities um, survey in 2018 found that only 3% of charity CEOs were black, which is l even lower than what we've seen in, in FE and in HE in schools. Uh, and respect to boards, the Charity Commission. Um, 2017 research into board effectiveness found that 92% of all charity trustees were white. Um, only 9% or 9.6% of trustees in the top 100 charities by income are from a black background. And the Kiva report is highlighted despite repeated attention being drawn to the issue, figures on racial diversity in the charity sector have remained static for a number of years. Again, this is something we've seen in, in FE, HE and, um, and schools. Um, and I just think it's really, really interesting that this is, um, we've, we've got this episode today. Um, it's just been repeated, isn't it, Stella? You know, like what we're sort of seeing here across all different elements of... Uh, uh, exactly, uh, Gavin. But the, the important thing is that we're all coming together now. Um, to collaborate to shift things. I think that we shouldn't really beat ourselves up about the data. That's the starting point now. Let's see what we can do together. Anti-racism in action, collaboration. Let's see how we can actually um, tackle this and make a difference. So it's, it's yeah, good. it's, it's, it's we're really, on the really move, good. Gavin. We're moving. Yeah, and, and I and I agree. It's like, it's like looking, and then it's going to be this whole part around listening and learning, and then taking action, isn't it? Really, which is great. Two brilliant guests. Um, we've got Catherine um, from the Voluntary Action Doncaster. We've got Maddie um, from the National Association for Voluntary and Community Association. I wonder, um, Catherine and uh, Kath and Maddie, if you could join us in the studio. Hey, Kath. Hey, Maddie. How are you? Hi, Gavin. How are you? Hi, Stella. Yeah, really, really good. Hello. Um, Stella and Kath, um, you know each other from, from a while ago now, don't you? Because I know you was working at BLI. I don't know if, Stella, if you wanted to explain that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kath uh, was on the steering uh, committee for the Black Leadership Initiative, which was an amazing initiative that won uh, the Queen's uh, uh, Award for um, volunteering way back. And I wonder, Kath, you know, we... From that uh, work that you did representing the department on the steering committee, your journey, your personal journey out of uh, public sector into, right, into the charity sector, and now, you know, Voluntary Action uh, Doncaster, BFELG affiliate. How has this, you know, the, the, this whole um, agenda, this whole movement, how, 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 what's your journey been like to still be uh, in this space? Well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to everybody today. Um, I think my journey, since leaving the, the civil service, it's, it's been a, a bit of a, a, a personal journey in terms of finding somewhere where I felt comfortable and a good fit for me at my stage of career. Um, I took up the role as the Chief Executive of Voluntary Action Doncaster um, almost two years ago now. Um, and this was um, a new organisation, a new infrastructure organisation. Um, so the role of Voluntary Action Doncaster is really to coordinate um, the work of the community and voluntary groups locally and act as that brokering and advocacy um sort of organisation for the sector, representing the interests of the sector with statutory organisations, um, and also to try and foster meaningful partnerships and collaborations between all the various um, organisations within the Doncaster area. So coming to, to this role, um, I was very early on asked whether Voluntary Action Doncaster would be willing to host the Inclusion and Fairness Forum. And of course, I sort of grabbed it with both hands um, because that's exactly what we're about, ensuring equity and fairness and making um, people be nice to people, not making people, but helping people be nice to people because uh, that compassion uh, for human beings is essentially um, what the third sector, what drives the third sector. Uh, so hosting the Inclusion and Fairness Forum, we've got a, a remit which is beyond um racism looking at all the intersectionality of all the the diverse uh, issues facing uh, dogs to communities but i was aware that we needed to be really clear and taking action specifically around anti-racism and um, so that's why i reached out to my old friends and colleagues 
um, to see what support and how we could work together because that that um, experience, uh, expertise, and structure is something that we we don't have internally. We're a tiny organisation, so that collaboration and, and and drawing on the skills and expertise of colleagues is is what we needed. Great. You mentioned Kath, an infrastructure organisation. What does that What does that mean? Um, infrastructure organisation. Ordinary people, like. like. <laughs> Thanks for asking that, Stella, because I want to know as well. So thank you. <laughs> so within the third sector, um, the, the the makeup of our community and voluntary groups, uh, there are lots of small micro organisations that are really out there in the communities actively doing what they need to do um, to support individuals in their in their uh, area um, and it the role of an infrastructure organization is to act as that um, ears eyes um, and, and, and mouthpiece of that sector so that we can reflect the, the the positives and the pain that those micro organizations are feeling and try and do something about it um, so one of the things which is really, really important to us at the moment is around funding and commissioning. So trying to influence the way in which um, <clears throat> big organisations like the local authorities contract or, or commission services is quite unwieldy and, and not fit for purpose for your grassroots organisation. So that advocacy and, and, and role there, it's very broad ranging, but that hopefully gives you a bit of an insight to... to to, to what an infrastructure organisation is about. Yeah, thank oh, thank you. you very much for that. Yeah. Um, today's show is actually very timely because literally just yesterday there was an announcement around the Anti-Racism um, Alliance. So I wonder if I could ask you both, um, Kath and Maddie. Maddie, maybe if I could bring you in first because you're so patient uh, with, uh, with, with us all. But, um, if you could um, maybe highlight you know, what, what that was about and what does that mean? So as Kath describes, um, the BCS infrastructure is about supporting communities and supporting people to connect their communities and do the stuff that matters most to them. So NAVCA is a national umbrella body for organisations like Kath. We've got 187 members right across England. And we're about equality and community empowerment and putting that empowerment into communities to do the stuff that matters most. And so when Black Lives Matter came around, we took quite a hard look at ourselves and found that we were lacking effectively as a network around how engaged and connected we were with black communities, around sometimes a lack of trust with black communities, um, and that it, it, was, it was too white dominated as a network. So we've been looking at, at NAVCA ourselves, but also looking at our role as a catalyst within that wider network of support structures and making sure that that is reaching out more widely and having the uncomfortable conversations that you were describing earlier on. So in coming together, we've, we've formed this anti-racist group, which is made up of NAVCA staff and trustees and then members. I wanted to develop a statement of principles that acts as a catalyst to that wider network to come on board. So we've got kind of the 10 or 15 organisations that are at the forefront, but they're at very different stages along their journey. It's again what we were talking about earlier on about, about that, that journey from not to ever get there, but <laughs> trying to get to a better place. And so we want to develop a set of principles that people could sign up to where they're at, which would support, encourage, cajole, be the catalyst to take further action. And so we published that today. And then um, in the East Midlands, Kath and some colleagues have taken that further to cascade it from the infrastructure organisation to the community groups themselves. So that Kath, if you want to pick it up from there with the Alliance? Yeah, so um, we don't just work in silos. We try and work um, across our, our geographical patch and, and support each other on uh, issues that are really important. So, for example, I also uh, work very closely with with uh, my peers in South Yorkshire on developments around the integrated care system. So that's a one. So this work in, in terms of anti-racism um, is something where we felt that we needed that collaboration and support cooperation across the, the patch. Um, so having issued um, or having joined the alliance and, and got our trustees to to sign up and endorse that. Um, we wanted to see how we, the, the, the voice strengthened when you've got more people together. Um, so uh, we definitely felt it was important um, as a, not just to have the statement, but to, <clears throat> excuse me, show that we're going to act on it. And that commit, that public commitment through the, the press release, release that we, we've issued um, demonstrates the starting uh, point of our action uh, to actually take 
stuff forward seriously, share our learning and, and make sure uh, that we have that, that peer um, touch point so we can challenge and support each other on the journey. Yeah, no, that's mm -hmm. really good. Can, can I ask, um, the, the figures we gave earlier um, at the top of the show were very stark. Um, and it's something we've seen repeated and we've always sort of you know, delved into it a little bit more in, in sort of in schools, in HE, in FE. Why do you think that, you know, those, those figures are reflected um, in, in the voluntary sector? And, and obviously you're doing stuff about it, but you know, maybe to put it into context, you live and breathe it. So is it, you know, I think you know, if there's any insights you can share, Maddie, I can see you're nodding now. I don't know if there's any insights you can maybe share at all. Yeah, certainly we know it's an issue. We know the, the formal sector is um, very dominated by white people. And certainly for, for our network of infrastructure organisations, as, as I said earlier on, we know we need to connect more and connect better with Black-led organisations. And we've seen right across the network that the Black Lives Matter campaign and indeed the pandemic and the disproportionate impact the pandemic had on um, communities of colour has really driven organisations to reach out and build trust and connections and relationships the wider set of community organisations. So some of the figures you were talking about with charities, the, the nuances of the world in which we work is that many of the organisations that me and Kath are working with are community organisations that aren't formally structured as a charity. So they're much smaller and maybe 70% of them have an income not of less than a million, but of less than £10,000. So they really wow. are micro. In our world, a million pounds is actually quite big. So um, we've been <laughs> yeah, we've, we've been reaching out and and engaging and connecting and doing all of that, um, because of the informal nature of lots of the groups they're working with, we haven't got um, hard numbers about that. But we know we need to do more, which is what this work is about of trying to do more and trying to do better. Um, and particularly that the trustees point I think is a really important one, where um, charities and community organisations are governed by a board of trustees. And we know that the diversity of those trustees isn't good enough, that there are too many white people, too many older people, too many people who are in their 60s. Um, and so attracting younger people, people from different backgrounds to be trustees is really important because they're the people ultimately who steer charities and community groups, who set the direction, who make decisions about um, where it's going, and what the priorities are. So we're doing some work with Gamil Yafai, for example, from Equity Marketplace to put on some workshops to help our members and their members think about what action they're taking. And we've got one specifically for trustees and thinking about how we diversify trustee boards. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. We, can, still, can we've I, had this time I, and time again. Yeah, sorry, carry on. Can I come in there, Gavin? Uh, you, you, um, you said, um, I don't know, I can't recall whether it was you, Maddie, or Kath talked about, about trust. What do you think is at the root of this uh, lack of trust or absence of trust by by um, black communities? Because if, if, we, if we can understand what that is, yeah. we've got a chance to work with them in the workshops and so on. Through the work of the Inclusion and Fairness Forum, we have had conversations um, with a range of minoritized groups, including uh, people of color. And the common um, issue throughout those conversations um, is, do I see myself reflected or do, mm -hmm. comfortable? Well, so that visibility is probably one of our biggest barriers. Um, so how we turn that around is it, it's, it's going it's, it's challenging. Um, we're having conversations at the moment through um, a review, a peer review actually within Doncaster in terms of um, the the partner organisations, so the college, the local authority, the chamber, the NHS, etc. Um, and again, um, this recruitment issue, um, not only in terms of the, the leaders, but through it, in various different parts of the organisation, recruitment is a, is, um, a, a problem. Um, and we need to sort of do some real focused work on looking at where the barriers are. Is it in the advertising and we're putting the adverts in the right place? Uh, is it the language within the job description? Is that all, every single bit of the process will need to be dissected and, and looked at and hopefully working together, uh, we'll be able to um, improve the process, not just for, for ourselves, which is pretty key. And by the way, you know, can I advertise that we've got a vacancy on our trustee board? We need a, a treasurer. So anybody who's interested, get in touch. Um, 
So, uh, yes, I mean, I think it is about being welcoming, be, being um, <coughs> where possible, uh, having that, that visibility um, of, of diversity, um, but also working together. I think it's also about structural racism and building trust with communities where it's been lacking in the past because decisions have been made which have excluded communities <coughs> and groups and organisations. And I think once you've been excluded or not felt part of something, then you, you, you back off. Of course you do. So it's about rebuilding years of underinvestment, underinvolvement and under representation of certain parts of the community. So I think to not acknowledge that and not recognise we need to do more to build it back, I think would be missing part of those difficult conversations that we need to be having. Um, and I think we dismantle some of the structures we've put in place and rebuild them in a way which connects better with um, with black communities. Yeah, well, thank you guys for being on. Yeah, open thank about you. that. Stella, it's a really good question. Do you know what I mean? Because it's it's like the root of of how you can sort of address this, really, isn't it? Yeah. Kath, we heard about a bit about your journey. Maddie, I wonder if we could hear a bit about your journey. Why anti-racism is important to you? Um, I didn't know if you wanted to this. Um, yeah, to share a bit because it was interesting hearing Kath at the top. I didn't want to to leave you out, Maddie, as well. Um, so I've been at NAVCA since, well, a year almost now, since the middle of March last year. Before that, I was Chief Executive Voluntary Action Sheffield. So Kath's opposite number in the uh, neighbouring borough. And um, I suppose our, our mission and vision was always around um, equality and um, thriving communities, community empowerment. But I think I was perhaps a little bit complacent about the importance of um, the anti-racist nature of that in that well yes of course we're doing good so that's okay isn't it so when the Black Lives Matter campaign really escalated in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing and then the disproportionate impact of the pandemic kind of collided in the groups and the, the networks that I was building from Voluntary Action Sheffield and it was really apparent both that communities of colour were facing this massive um, disproportionate impact from COVID and were struggling to be heard, perhaps, which then collided with the Black Lives Matter campaign, setting out the lack of voice, impact, influence, presence that some of those groups had. And so it was by reaching out and talking to people who were leading those organisations and really being challenged by them that made me really appreciate much better the level of change that we needed and how that might come about. And perhaps it was conversations that I'd maybe been avoiding having um, that really were brought to a head. And then working with some brilliant leaders who helped me on that journey and helped to reconstruct some activity we were doing in Sheffield, both in response to COVID, but also to look to, um, for example, distribute funding more effectively to a wider set of, of communities. So when I came into NAVCA last March, I kind of brought that with me and could see it's um, replicated across the country in many different places again brilliant leaders doing fantastic work um some specifically around um uh, black communities so in lancashire there's a, a, a network specifically to support black-led organizations and other places like with cast where um it's reconstructing and building the infrastructure for the vcs so that it really is engaging with all communities locally um, can i um, you go first, Gavin. Oh, go on, go for it, sir. Okay. I was really interested, um, Maddie, in um, the, 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 what's happening in Kafka because looking at your um, anti um, racism group and what it's trying to do, really ambitious to be for the organization first to be anti racist and then to for the network facilitating the network um, and we formed a steering group. I wonder, can you tell us a bit um, um, about where you are now? Because I think that if, if what you're trying to do could be achieved, even if it's 10 years, 20 years time, that would be amazing. Where are you now? And I know that you've just, you, you, you sort of started that last, last year. Where's it going? 
So to be honest, I think I feel frustrated that we've not gone as far and as fast as I wanted to. <laughs> and so we've we've sort of, I suppose it's like an onion, it's it's unpeeling onion. So we started very much internally, I suppose with some of the easy stuff. So looking at our policies, our systems, our processes, and making sure, as Kath said, that right to peeling it right back to make sure that they are inclusive and anti-racist. So looking at our recruitments, looking at our um our systems, looking at, for example, we had our um, conference last year, making sure that we had a diversity of speakers and perspectives coming to that conference. Um, so starting to look at how we're working and who we're working with. But then I think the real opportunity is then the network and how we're a catalyst and we can influence that wider network more widely. Hence the anti-racist group that we, we, we set up bringing in members of the network. And they really relate to the points made at the beginning around looking, listening and learning. And we spent a lot of time having really uncomfortable conversations in that network. We spent several meetings talking about words and language because getting that right is so important and so difficult and we're not there yet. Um, so there's some things I'd say we have made some tangible differences. So going back to you know our, our recruitment process, for example, going back to how we're um, making sure that when we have events that they are diverse, make sure if I, I use my power more effectively, perhaps in making sure that if I'm um, if, I, if I'm on a platform, that it's not um, a platform which is uniform in its perspective and view. But then thinking about the network and where we go more widely about it not to be about NAVCA speaking, but about NAVCA amplifying other voices or bringing other people into conversations where they might not have been. Um, thinking about how we create spaces for other people to have those uncomfortable conversations, which is much as what that network has been about, and supporting other people to come into that space and to think about their own learning. Um, and that's where I think there's, there's the opportunity for greater impact. But also then is where I get a bit frustrated, I suppose, is that there's so much more to do. And the, the challenge of um, diverse leadership or communications or events that are absolutely diverse around our own membership and staff, um, there's still a long way to go with it. So I think this is still very much a starting point, although I hope that we are making some progress both in how, what we're doing and how we're behaving and how we're um, engaging with more people, but then also how we're perhaps supporting, cajoling, encouraging other people to also get into that space to, to make the impact greater. Yes, yeah, so really like ideal. Ginny said, it's a, it's a journey and um, I, I would say it's taken us 400, 500 years to get here, so it will take it will take time to, uh, but uh, we'll ex we hope we can accelerate things in decades but it's interesting gavin isn't it that you know we've heard we had the the recruitment companies and we were learning now that a number of organizations are specifying to their search companies we must have a diverse shortlist which is great and i read in uh, uh the uh kavka's uh, you know the your statement of intent or part of your plan that you're saying that you will not uh, uh, uh sit on um uh, platforms that aren't diverse and that's a, that's such a strong uh, 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 statement really yeah yeah, yeah and for example recruitment it's not just just happening it's not just about the policy saying we will be diverse and we'll do blind sifting but mm. um, I've made it with this um, particularly for senior leadership jobs I'll not have a panel which doesn't include people of color um, mm. but I think it's about how do we develop an organization that people want to apply to and that's the nub of it. It's very, I think it's very cultural. And then still we've got another day when people know about and want to apply to. Doesn't matter what we do and systems and processes. Yeah, that's no, mm -hmm. really interesting. I think there's a, a couple of themes that come up from, from previous episodes as well. Governance and, and yeah. having diversity in, in governance. Also okay. reflection of, of uh, the community that you're working with in as well, that people can, can see a mirror back and, and feel inspired and feel inspired to move forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, guys, that time's nearly gone. I can't believe it. It's, it's, it's shot by. If you could dream and dream big, because it's it's interesting. Um, the, the pandemic, what we've gone through, Black Lives Matter, what we've gone through. Um, it's all been around community, particularly from the um, from the pandemic. It's been so much more to the to the forefront to everyone's view. If you could dream and dream big, what would you want to see in anti-racism in action for you, Kath? I think for me, um, although we're an infrastructure organisation and particularly focused in supporting our communities, um, it's about making sure that we're bringing everybody together on the same journey. 
uh, so recognizing people will be at different stages and, and when i say everybody i mean public sector private sector everybody i think you know, that that's the big ambition that we're not just supporting our own people but but in order to benefit the community we need to bring everybody along yeah no that's cool maddie what would you want to say so we talk about our, our ambition being to do ourselves out of a job because community is yeah. self-sufficient and thriving. And I think the same is true with being anti-racist. I want to do ourselves out of a job so we don't need to be here anymore for having this conversation because we've done it and we've got equity across communities. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Stella, what would you want to say? Gavin, you won't get away with it. <laughs> You got away with it last <laughs> last week. You didn't. Uh, my, my, my dream... Um, uh, as ever is to is to see uh, uh, people really um, being comfortable and working together uh, and uh, you know just living life together whether it's at, at, at work at home whether it's in faith spaces wherever because you see so much you know you know people on their own in silos i'd like to see our society where people are really in those communities working and living and playing uh together across generations really yeah sounds cool i won't avoid it um yeah we're talking about voluntary community and social enterprise i think for my dream for that would be is representation for everyone in their community and um, but also that we can also increase diversity in community so it's what like, it goes in a circle if you know what i mean that we can just all come together and as everyone has said you know that we can um do ourselves out of a job really that it's just you know this just isn't an uncomfortable conversation anymore it just reflects what our community is and everyone can all work together our time is gone everyone thank you so much for joining us so what an incredibly interesting episode today really 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 key with what we've gone through with the pandemic in this next stage what is this next stage um around community has been so much more important for everyone um mm. and, and has lived it so this is really really interesting really important to address racism um in in our voluntary sectors and in charities and in social enterprise see you next week um this has been a total collaboration between black fe leadership group and fe news i hope you enjoyed so i hope you feel inspired we'll see you again next week thank you maddie thank you Kath. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.